Hello, this is a recording of the talk given at the annual Faith Lecture um, at the Ipswich University campus by myself, Robin Hunt, entitled An Animist Ethic, Modern Paganism and Environmentalism. I'm going to try and make this as close to the original talk as I can, depending on the vagarism memory, of course. Um, so the aim of the talk was to start out by defining what animism is, or at least giving a definition, because there are several competing definitions of animism, and then going on to look at how animist notions impact on ecology and environmental movements for the protection of the planet and the various species on the planet, both plant and animal and otherwise, and then to look at stances taken within modern-day paganism that are influenced by animism and the sort of mutual feedback loop, if we can put it like that, between ecological movements and the various types of modern-day paganism. Now, um, given that the original talk was uh, an hour long, I, and I intend to do the same length here, I didn't want to bog it down too much with a long convoluted explanation of modern-day paganism in its various forms. Um, suffice to say that primarily in terms of defining what I mean by paganism, I'm looking at those um, currently practiced forms of spirituality and religion. Some people favour the term spirituality, some prefer the term religion, some don't mind either term, um, which are either polytheist or pantheist in practice. Now there are going to be some forms of spiritual practice that the um, practitioners regard as pagan, which don't fit either polytheist or pantheist molds, but coming up with a definition that fits every conceivable variation is nigh on impossible. Mm -hmm. So this is just a working definition for the purposes of this talk. Uh, polytheists, just in case anyone is unfamiliar with the term, regard the universe as being populated by a wide number of gods, goddesses and other entities with which they um, engage at least with some of them at any rate um, for purposes of reverence, for purposes of understanding themselves, of engaging with daily life. And these various different deities and, and entities of one sort or another are seen as real beings, not simply archetypal projections or cultural patternings or anything of that sort. They are seen as, as actual beings with their own wishes, desires, agendas, their own sense of agency. Pantheism um, is more akin, for those of you familiar with science fiction, with the notion in the Star Trek films of the Force. So pantheists often take the idea that the various different gods and goddesses are poetic ways of trying to understand this universal force that permeates everything, every living being, every animate and supposedly inorganic um, presence in the universe is part and parcel of this one overriding force which is not personalized as a god or goddess it's not seen as having a sort of identity and agenda and individuality but rather a universal permeating force so that all human beings and cats and dogs and horses and trees and bushes and rivers and, and mountains and so forth participate in this permeating universal presence and there are some people who um, are not quite polytheist, not quite pantheist, but participate in a little bit of both in terms of how they understand the universe. So these are not mutually exclusive points of view. And as I say, there are other points of view um, that come under the label of modern day paganism, which don't really fit within either polytheism or pantheism, but that's the working approach we're going for. Now the quote here from Richard Nelson, that according to the Kayukan teaches the tree I lean against fills me, hears what I say about it, and engages me in a moral reciprocity based on responsible use. In their tradition, the forest is both a provider and a community of spiritually empowered beings. There is no emptiness in the forest, no unwatched solitude, no wilderness where a person moves outside moral judgment and law. And the Kayukan are a um, native um, nation, a native group, based in Canada around the Yukon River. I'm not wholly sure if the tribe gave its name to the river or the river to the tribe, but they're based in that region of Canada. And what Nelson is describing here 
we could well apply to animism in many, many different parts of the world. Because animism is this perception that the world is full of spirits. Now, for me personally, I, I'm a polytheist. And for me, the distinction between animism and polytheism is really more an issue of scale rather than anything else. In that polytheism emphasizes the notion, the notion of gods and goddesses at a rather grand level. Um, entities that can roam here, there and everywhere and have vast lifespans, potentially immortal, um, for all I know. Whereas animism is much more concerned with the immediate and the local. So if you if you want to make a distinction utilising um, Nelson's quote here, we might draw the distinction between the spirit of each individual tree in the forest, which is the more animist approach, the, the living consciousness of a given tree, and the god or goddess of the forest as a whole, and indeed of all forests everywhere, which is more the polytheist approach, the overarching, um, wider-reaching spirit rather than the purely localised spirit, although often there can be a, a big grey area where it's hard to tell quite where one ends and the other begins. But I, I don't want to go too um, bogged down into the theology of the matter at the moment at any rate, people have any questions on that they can always email across um, so just as uh, Nelson here is hypothetically leaning against a tree and communicating with the tree um, expressing himself to the tree and the tree expresses itself in exchange obviously not necessarily in, in terms of, of um, the tree being able to speak like some character in a, a Disney film but rather it can articulate its consciousness in ways appropriate to itself. And one thing worth bearing in here, bearing in mind here, is that animism isn't suggesting that trees and rocks and zebras and elephants and, and dolphins and what have you have the same consciousness as human beings. So this is not, which is a criticism sometimes made of it by people who do not favour an animist approach, this is not some form of projection, some form of anthropomorphizing the world around us and assuming that uh, a tree or a rose bush or a cat has the same sort of thoughts and feelings and ideas and the same consciousness as a human being. Not at all. It's understanding that each entity has a consciousness an array of thoughts, of feelings, for lack of a better word, that befit its own niche in existence. The way a dolphin thinks and feels and what goes to the mind of a dolphin is befitting to the nature of a dolphin, just as what goes to the mind of a human is befitting to the nature of a human. So this is not to say that we all have the same minds, or that, um, not obviously not even the same language, but that we can communicate in concepts and terms which some of them will be very familiar, one species to another, like the urge to survive, the um, hunger for food, the wish to reproduce, etc. And others might be so specific to one species that a different species would genuinely struggle to comprehend what is being expressed and articulated because they'd have no... Um, comparison to make within their own range of consciousness and experiences. And so sometimes there can be these kind of communication gaps between one species and another, such that, for an, an obvious example, I can very easily see when my dog is in distress because the way a dog articulates distress is reasonably similar to the way a human being does it, that I can fairly easily empathise with my dog when he's upset about something. A spider, on the other hand, I, I really don't know how a spider expresses and articulates distress. If a spider were distressed, would I be able to identify that fact any more than would the spider be able to identify if I'm distressed? I, I don't know that we'd have much grounds for comparison in terms of body language, in terms of vocalizations, uh, and all of the various other ways in which different species express their own upset, their own distress. So there may be gaps of communication between one species and another. Um, an important point in this quote to emphasise is this idea of a community of beings. So within the forest, it's not just the trees, it's the, the shrubs, the, the various 
little ground growing plants it's the birds the insects the mammals the reptiles the fish in the rivers uh, it's the myriad number of entities that come together to compose the entirety of a forest all of those living entities and an animist often uses the when they speak of living entities will often include in that beings that modern Western science would regard as inorganic and therefore not possessed of any consciousness at all, such as, as boulders and rocks. Um, so it, the notion of what is alive in the first place to an animist is quite, quite a challenging notion to people unfamiliar with animism, in that it includes a much broader picture of what constitutes life over and above current-day... Um, more scientific, more rationalist notions of organic life. It's a much bigger picture. And it does, of course, challenge even within, even if we just stick to talking about organic life, it does challenge the notion of the mechanics of consciousness in that for a fair stretch of time, within biology and psychology and, and various related disciplines, we have understood the consciousness of animals as being very much related to brain structure. Different animals, different species have different brain structures, different nervous systems. Um, we understand the, the capacity for intelligence, for problem solving, for consciousness and awareness as being very much related to brain structure. Now, obviously, in this quote, we're talking about trees, and, and trees clearly don't have brains, at least not of a sort that makes a direct comparison with um, an animal life form easy to make. But there are increasingly large numbers of botanists who talk about the capacity of trees to communicate with each other using um, chemical release processes and fungal networks underground. And the, the what shall we say, the organic structures which underpin the capacity of a tree to have some awareness, to exchange messages with another tree, to communicate with other trees, let alone the capacity to communicate with things that aren't trees at all, like birds or insects or whatever, um, is very much in its infancy in terms of how we as humans understand the, the mechanics. So we've got a, an understanding of the mechanics of brain structure in animal species, we don't have a, a, a clear understanding of the mechanics by which consciousness might work in a tree, much less in a, a daffodil or some other form of plant life. So a lot of this is, whilst these are ideas that have been accepted in many, many, many cultures for thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years, when it comes to modern scientific understandings of what consciousness is and the biological structures that underpin the functioning of consciousness a lot of this is is sort of off the off the chart so to speak uh, and will be considered outside the range of plausibility and that's even before we get on to talk about the notion of rocks and inorganic forms having some kind of consciousness as well if we're struggling to get to grips with the notion of consciousness in plant life. It gets even stranger if we're talking about the consciousness in rocks and rivers and so forth, let alone if we get on to even more obtruse levels. So, for example, there are many cultures that regard a number of inanimate um, human-manufactured objects as having the capacity for spirit, having the capacity for animus. Um, which comes from the Latin word for breath, to breathe spirit into something, the breath of life. Uh, the presence of, of, of animating spirit. Uh, many cultures, for example, regard a sword or a drum or a, a basket that's been obviously made by, by humans as having the capacity. Now, it's not always clear in, in and different cultures have different stances on this. So in some cultures there is a perception that all things have spirit and in others there is a perception that only some of the manufactured things around us have spirit. And why some do and others don't is sometimes unclear. Um, there are some cultures who argue it's more a function of usage. So that let's say a, a sword that is uh, 
um, laboured on by the blacksmith to create it and then handed down from parent to child through many generations of a family. Um, people have sweated over it and, and almost certainly bled over it and valued it, treasured it, poured their emotional investments into that sword. That object will have far more animus than a, um, a cheap plastic toy that comes with a Happy Meal that gets played with for three minutes and then lobbed in a bin and forgotten about. Um, something mass-produced, there's been very little investment in the making of the thing, there's been very little investment in the usage of the thing, it's just there for a few minutes and then forgotten about and discarded. Some cultures would regard that cheap plastic toy as being highly unlikely to have animus. So within the realm of animism there are different points of view, different understandings as to what this is. Now the term animus, animism was coined by Sir Edward uh, Tyler back in the Victorian era um, and it's worth bearing in mind that when he coined the term it was intended in a slightly condescending, slightly snotty sort of a way to imply that this was a very primitive belief held by people in far-flung parts of the world that he as a very, very educated, very wealthy Victorian gentleman looked down his nose upon. And in as much as that term came about as a, a bit of a condescending term, there are people, some of them from the various cultures in far-flung parts of the world, who whilst they hold to the kinds of belief systems that Tyler was describing, don't like the word animism because it smacks of this rather colonial condescension by Tyler. Other people feel that the word has been so well used in the intervening um, century and more since Tyler uh, first coined it that even if he did mean it in a bit of a snotty fashion nowadays it can be used in a more neutral academic fashion to describe a set of philosophies and beliefs which come from many many different parts of the world indeed some historians would argue that if we go back to the early roots of human history then practically every tribe would once have been animist and some people argue that pra practically all societies still are more or less animist even if they don't necessarily use that term or um, possibly would be slightly embarrassed to admit that they are animist cultures because of this, this snottiness and this assumption that animism is a bit of a uh, a belittle thing. Um, the Swiss psychologist Jean Piaget, who studied child psychology quite extensively, also liked the term animism and applied it to a phase of mind which he felt young children went through, but, and again this returns to that slight element of condescension going on there, um, would grow out of. So for Piaget, animism within child development manifests itself through children talking to their teddy bears and their dollies and what have you and sort of having a, an engaged ongoing experience with their toys. Uh, obviously something that Hollywood through film, a whole raft of different films including the Toy Story cartoons has rather been captivated by this notion that toys are actually alive which is something that I suspect the vast majority of children strongly suspect uh, <laughs> to be true. Um, where we might cut part company, and by we I mean me, and <laughs> part company with BRJ, is that whilst he suggests this is a thing that people grow out of as they get older, I'd suggest it's not something we grow out of, it's something that remains with us. And whilst there probably are not that many 50-year-olds who talk to their teddy bears, there are nonetheless endless examples of people who will argue with their car, especially on a winter's morning when it's not starting properly who will have heated debates with a photocopier that appears to be in a cranky mood. And um, putting aside such humorous elements, um, we nonetheless persist in many people talk to trees. You don't have to be a pagan to talk to a tree. You can be of any religion or, or no religion whatsoever and engage in conversations like Nelson with trees. Um, Piaget also talks about the idea of young children who are um, it's a bit clumsy and they, they'll bump into a table and then apologise to the table for hurting it. He sees that again as this sort of childlike projection of consciousness onto things that he's quite convinced don't have consciousness. 
But I'd also suggest that this is something you can find in a great many adults as well, the assumption that there is consciousness in the world around us. Now, if we stick within the realm of psychology, we can argue from an evolutionary psychological viewpoint that there is perhaps a survival strategy in animism, in that if, going back to ancient times, we can imagine our very, very distant ancestors who were alive in much, much more dangerous eras than modern-day people living in, um, well, Ipswich, which is where this talk was originally given, but you know, most of the Western world is, is pretty safe most of the time. But our, our ancestors, we don't even have to go that far back in history to find periods of history where um, life has been a lot more dangerous than it is now. If we look at the things around us and we assume that they are aware and thinking and feeling and in some cases potentially having hostile feelings and thoughts in some cases having very helpful feelings and thoughts then we engage with the world around us in a much more alert aware way in which we assume intelligence in the, the world around us and where the intelligence is friendly we seek to work with it and where the intelligence is hostile we seek to take account of that hostility and strategize for our own greater survival. Now, where we make an attributional error, we assume there's consciousness in something that has no consciousness, then what have we really lost by making that assumption? Maybe we spend five minutes talking to something that can't understand a word we're saying. On the other hand, if we were to go around making the modern Western assumption that virtually nothing has consciousness, then the attribution error there would be to ignore consciousness in something that really does have it and fail to perceive either potential sources of help or potential sources of threat in those creatures and beings around us who actually do have awareness. So in a sense, we could argue that it's safer to assume consciousness even where there is none than to assume lack of consciousness where frequently there is consciousness and we would survive much more effectively if we factored in the awareness of other beings. Now at the moment we've so far been talking about trees and animals and, and, and so forth. One thing I'd like to emphasize here and, and my students that are familiar with my classes um, are at West Suffolk College will have been bored to death hearing about this because I can't on about it quite a lot in classes. Uh, it is very, very, very recently that most humans have recognised consciousness in most other humans. So forget about trees and, and zebras and elephants for a minute. Just human to human social engagement. It's really quite recent in human history. And still, in many parts of the world, there are people who hotly debate, as their ancestors have done for thousands of years, whether large swathes of humanity actually do have consciousness or not. You can regularly find um, various imams from Saudi Arabia recording podcasts in which they debate whether women have souls and have the same range of consciousness that men have. It's not that far back in time, living memory, where it was commonplace for people from one ethnic group to assume that people from a different ethnic group might not be actually fully human. They might have lowered levels of consciousness. Um, whilst it's quite, what should we say, fashionable these days to assume that racism is a one-way street, um, you can find examples amongst every racial group where they've looked at whoever the nearest other racial group is to them, and sometimes not even other racial groups, sometimes within the same ethnicity, but looking at people from a different country, a different social class, uh, a different position in the world from themselves, have wondered whether those other people, be that men looking at women, women looking at men, the rich looking at the poor, the poor looking at the rich, one country looking at the people from another country 10 miles down the road, speculating whether those humans actually have the full range of emotions and consciousness and thoughts and feelings that they do. Slavery, in all of its various manifestations, which has been in existence for thousands upon thousands of years in every part of the planet, 
and of course still illegally goes on to this very day. In fact, there are more people enslaved in the world today than there were 300 odd years ago. Slavery largely depends on the notion that the slave is a lesser kind of a human being than the person who owns them. And that that slave, often the justifications offered for slavery is that the kinds of people who get enslaved, whether they are from a particular ethnic group or a conquered country or, or um, people living in poverty or whatever, uh, often the justifications that the owners offer for why they enslave the others is that they that the enslaved people are somehow childlike. They lack the full range of adult consciousness. They need to be looked after. They need to be bossed around and given orders because they can't cope for themselves. Um, they, they are not as fully aware as the person who owns them is. It's a not dissimilar attitude that many parents have to their children, uh, within fair reason, because obviously children have yet to have the full range of life experiences that adults have, but the assumption that children need to be looked after. So that process of um, infantilizing other adults is a common bedrock for the, the justification for, for slavery and all manners of other, frankly, rather shoddy behaviors. Um, if we struggle to see full consciousness from one human to another human, it's unsurprising that many people will then struggle to see consciousness in something that is not human in the first place. So it becomes an issue. Um, there, so um, part of perceiving full consciousness is it's not perceiving identical consciousness, going back to what we were saying, that, that consciousness of non-human animals and trees and plants and so forth. Um, you, you don't have to perceive an identical consciousness to your own in another living being, but simply to recognize that there is agency, there is understanding, there is a capacity for pain, for pleasure, for hope, for fear, for, for love, for hate, for these factors that we constitute as personhood. And this is another um, hobby horse that I tend to ride, so I'll, I'll try not to because of the time factor. Um, to perceive personhood in someone else is partly about perceiving consciousness, but it's also about perceiving value. It's about perceiving a legal status that that other individual has certain rights, certain protections in law, which should not be violated. And just as we would not want someone we value to be murdered, if we extend personhood to the types of humans who perhaps previously have been denied it, then we are extending protections to them. So people who previously might have been killed with impunity suddenly be, become reclassified as persons who have legal status and cannot be subjected to the same rough treatment that previously they were subjected to when the law did not regard them as fully fledged persons. And there are countries around the world, New Zealand is, is an example of a country which has started to extend notions of legal personhood outside the remit of humanity to incorporate some other creatures. So in some parts of the world, the great apes have been granted legal recognition as, as persons, which means they cannot be subjected to um, certain medical procedures, for example, vivisection experiments and research, things like that, because they are regarded as having, a, in law, as having a capacity for pain and pleasure and so forth, which if not identical to that of a human being, at least puts them in a legal category that makes them worthy of protection. And this is an element of, of animism. It's um, not just an abstract spiritual notion, it is a pragmatic recognition that some other being, be they a fellow human, be they some other type of an animal, be they a plant, be they potentially a rock or a river or what have you, has a capacity for agency, has a capacity for desire, for hope, for fear, and so forth. And that, that therefore, means they must be granted certain protections, certain forms of common decency. They must be treated in a certain way and not run roughshod over. 
Now, obviously, we can look at history and find a billion examples of people from cultures who have held to all of these very sorts of beliefs I'm describing and nonetheless gone and run roughshod over somebody else and, and treated them like dirt. So holding to a set of beliefs and implementing them in daily life. We all know in every religion, in every philosophy, there are people who preach one thing and do another. That's human nature is to be a, a little bit hypocritical at times. Um, so it is not an absolute guarantee that merely having a culture which advocates for these principles automatically leads to, the, to every single person within that culture living their truth. Some of them will just kind of give lip service to it and won't necessarily follow through in terms of how they treat everyone around them. But we fundamentally, if, if you accept an animist point of view, fundamentally exist not just as, as isolated human beings, but we exist like Nelson in his forest community. We exist as part of a network of souls, if we can put it in religious terms, if you prefer slightly more secular terms, you could describe it as a network of sapiens, a network of awareness. There, there, are, there is ourselves, there are all the other human beings around us. There are all of the other animal species, the, the plant species and, and beyond around us. Um, many animist cultures also accept the idea of an invisible realm that they're not only the, the physical things we can see, the, the, the horses and the, the, the uh, giraffes and the um, pumas and what have you, but there are also potentially invisible entities. Um, the Greeks love to talk of their dryads and naiads and so forth, the consciousnesses of trees, the consciousnesses of rivers, the, these presences that sometimes could be seen by people uh, and, and inspire artworks and paintings and sculptures and all manner of things. Um, to return to a little bit of theology, Martin Buber, amongst many, many other ideas, proposed the notion of um, what was translated into English as the I-thou relationship. It's an idea that has um, resonance with, with notions from Freud, from all sorts of other people, um, about the notion of the subject-object, or I-thou, if you prefer, which is really subject-subject. Um, as a subject, I am aware of myself, just as you are aware of yourselves. So I am a subject to me, and you are a subject to you. We have our own reality. We are aware of ourselves as persons, as people. Now, we may be aware, and Buber felt that this was the ideal way to go for a morally upstanding society. We may be aware of the personhood of others around us. So we, we are subjects, and we know that they too are subjects. We have dreams, and they have dreams. We have loves and hates and hopes, and they have loves and hates and hopes. We are aware of that. And so we treat those people around us as subjects. We go subject, subject. Or, to put it in Buber's terms, I, thou. On the other hand, it's easy to forget that others are subjects, others are people. And we may not simply forget it, we may hold to it as a matter of ideological principle that certain presences in the world around us are not people. They're things, they're objects. An object, fundamentally, is a thing. Now, we might be quite content and majority of us, I suspect, to talk about chairs and tables and so forth as things. We don't regard, most people don't regard chairs and tables as having personhood, as having consciousness, as having thoughts, feelings, hopes, fears, dreams. They're just inanimate lumps of wood and material and plastic and metal and so forth. Um, they're things. Now, Buber wasn't out arguing from an animist point of view. His main interest was in the relationship between humans and God and humans and other humans, rather than broadening it out too far. Uh, and certainly if we go back to talking about issues such as slavery, um, or a, a popular subject to talk about within feminist movements is the objectification of, of women. It's quite as easy to objectify men as well, it has to be said. Um, but the way in which some people are not treated as 
people. They're not treated as having the full range of thoughts and feelings and hopes and dreams and consciousnesses. They're treated as things to use, and having been used, they can be chucked away. And this was a concern of Immanuel Kant as well, the idea that we too often treat people as a means to an end. They have some usage for us, we get the use out of them, and then we chuck them away and forget about them. Um, if not literally chuck them away, <laughs> at least we forget that they are there. Uh, so the, the relationship we might have to the um, person who works on the counter in the local supermarket, we turn up, put our basket of goods before them, and we expect that um, member of staff to tot up the price of the goods, we hand over the money, say thank you very much, and go away. We don't really give much thought, by and large, to that person behind the counter. Are they having a good day or a bad day? Are they married or single? Do they have children? What are their hopes? What are their dreams? What are their likes? What are their dislikes? We're probably vaguely aware that they are actually a human being and they probably do have hopes and dreams, but we give very little thought to it. So at a purely practical level, we tend to have a subject-object relationship with that person. They're there, they have a task to do, totting up the price of, of goods in the supermarket and, and exchanging money and, and so forth. And as long as they do that task, we don't give them much thought beyond that. And this for Buber is a bit of a slippery slope. It's not the end of the world to be in a rush and too busy not to pay very much attention to the person sitting behind the, the counter in a shop. But it's part of a slippery slope that might lead to wider and wider and wider numbers of people being treated as matters of convenience. They're just there, they provide a service, and we forget about them. And if we can do that with other human beings, of course, we can do that with um, all manner of other entities and, and, and creatures around us, in which they, they become things rather than possessed of value, rather than subjects with their own lives, their own existences. Um, so when it comes to my dog, I'm not quite sure what he gets up to when I'm not in the house, um, but I'm aware he doesn't just sort of lay there as an inanimate object. I'm aware that he's off sniffing around and, and sleeping and chewing his toys and scoffing his biscuits and probably barking at other dogs out the window and what have you. He has his own life outside of me. We don't all necessarily think in those terms all of the time. Uh, and certainly if we're, we're looking at things like dolls and teddy bears and whatnot, some people would regard it as deeply bizarre to speculate what the the teddy bear does when you're not around to, to watch it. They just assume it's a, a bit of stuffed material that sits there and does nothing because it has no soul. But the animist would regard it as having soul, as having presence, as having vitality. Uh, Nurit Bur David um, talks about an idea, not so much within animism, animism per se, but it does relate to animism, of the relational self. Her argument is that in the West, we've come to think of ourselves as isolated individuals, that we are ourselves, we are these definable things that exist outside of the bubble of society. She argues that we're not, and she argues the term de-vigil, which is not a spelling mistake by me, it's de-vigil rather than individual, to take the isolated self out and understand that we exist as part of an ongoing network of relationships. So... We might exist, um, a, a particular person might say that they are a, a mother, a wife, a sister, an aunt, a um, teacher, a brain surgeon, a um, keen gardener, that they are um, tall or short or whatever. All of those things <coughs> exist in relation to others. Now, obviously, being a mother, an aunt, a sister implies the existence of the person towards whom you are a mother, towards whom you are a sister, and so forth. But being a keen gardener from an animist point of view, a garden is a... Uh, plants, flowers, trees, shrubs, living beings to whom you are related. And descriptive terms like being short or tall exist in relations to others. You're only short er or taller than somebody else. If every single person on the planet was exactly six foot tall, their notions of tall and short would be irrelevant because we'd all be identical. 
So ideas of short and tall and fat and thin and kind and generous and mean and stingy and so on. All of these are reflections of how we relate to either in physical comparison or in the way we treat people, such as by being generous towards them or being very tight-fisted towards them. These are descriptions of how we relate to others. And if you took others away, if you put somebody on a solitary desert island, there was no one for them to be kind to or generous to or mean to or no one for them to be taller than or, or shorter than or, or fatter than or thinner than. No one for them to be a mother, an aunt, an uncle, a brother, a, a friend to. You strip away all of those relationships, what actually is left? And Bird David argues very little is left once you strip away all of our human relationships. But to this we can add the animist level of the non-human relationship. Our relationship to all manner of other things, including, to put it in a more overtly religious context, our relationship to the realm of the divine, whether you conceive of that as a single monotheistic entity or whether you conceive it as a polytheistic multitude of beings towards whom you can have a relationship as well as the relationships we have with the more overtly physical beings around us. All of this defines us, and you cannot take, the point of the relational self theory is you cannot take the individual out of the network, because remove the network and you cease to exist. You become a non-being. Now this artwork here is by Susan seton uh, no, Well, she's dead now, but an American artist from um, 20th century, who was very, very inspired by shamanistic cultures that she had experienced of and, and, and encountered and painted lots of pictures um, inspired by the myths and legends of the cultures that she had met. And a lot of her art is, is very much this sort of, like the picture here, it overlaps one being over another. And that very much captures this no notion of the relational self, of how the various different entities around us whether it's human to human, human to wolf, um, wolf to tree, tree to bird, whatever the particular setups may be, how they all interrelate to each other and how we, none of us, exist in isolation. We are part of a constant network around us. And that network includes the living and the dead. So our relation not only to all of the people we know at the moment in our lives, but also our relation to the people we know and to the people we've never, we couldn't put a name to, who have died and laid the groundwork for us to be here now. Um, the fact that we may live in houses that were built by people long time ago who have long since died, using techniques developed by people even further back in time. That we speak a language that has evolved over thousands and thousands and thousands of years, developed by oh Lord knows how many millions, billions of people, who've all left their legacy. We live in a network of the dead, as well as of our fellow living people. And we could go even stranger in terms of thinking about the future generations, whether we have children or people like myself who, who don't have children, but nonetheless will have an impact through teaching, through writing books, telling stories, um, who knows one day maybe donating my organs, not that I can imagine anyone would want them, but still, um, to future generations and enabling them to survive. We are all part of a network not only of who went before us, our ancestors, but also of our descendants, those who are yet to come. And from an animistic point of view, time is, to borrow a phrase from Doctor Who, a little bit wibbly-wobbly, we may feel as if we live in a constant presence. But time, present, future, past, interweaves constantly and is not the static, rigid phenomena that we may sometimes imagine it to be. Uh, and therefore, our network of involvements is not just here, now. It's a network of involvement stretching back to the dawn of time. It's a network of involvement stretching forward to all of those generations of humans and cats and dogs and, and horses and budges and, and um, swallows and, and oak trees and hawthorn trees and everything else that are yet to come. So it's a, a much more complex and involved interlaying of life. Now, Arne Ness was a Norwegian um, environmentalist uh, 
to the best of my knowledge, he wasn't pagan, but clearly he was inspired by a lot of ideas that fit very um, well within an animist framework. And he talks here about care flows naturally if the self is widened and deepened so that protection of free nature is felt and conceived as protection of ourselves. Just as we do not need morals to make us breathe, so if your self in the wide sense embraces another being, you need no moral exhortation to show care. You care for yourself without feeling any moral pressure to do it. Um, complex set of ideas here, and we don't really have the time to go into them in, in massive amount of detail. But part of his argument is not that we don't need morals per se, but rather that we don't need someone to hector us and tell us that we ought to do this, we ought to do that, we ought to do the other. His argument is that the care and nurture flows naturally from a desire to cherish life. Now, in the first instance, the life we want to cherish may be our own, but it also extends to cherishing the lives of children, um, primarily our own children, of course, but also nephews and nieces and cousins and so forth, to protecting and nourishing the lives of our pets, of our for farmers, for their farm animals, for gardeners, for their plants. Uh, there are all sorts of life around us that we cherish. And whilst there are some critiques that could be made of this notion of putting too much emphasis on self, nonetheless, Ness's point is that if we can encourage people to reconsider what is, shall we say, self-interest, who are they caring about, who are they nurturing, who are they looking after? It's themselves, their family, human family, their, their animals, be they pets or farm animals or whatever they may be, the plants in their house, the plants in their garden, but also beyond that, of course, and this is where Ness seeks to motivate people into more environmentalist work. If you, well, everybody drinks water at some, some level, the, the quality of the rivers, the quality of the reservoirs from which we get our water, the if you're an omnivore, the quality of the animals and plants that you eat. If you're a vegetarian or a vegan, it's the quality of the plants um, alone. But even so, you'd still have a, a care and concern for animal life. Um, the quality of the air we breathe, and therefore of the forests, of the fungi, of the, the various plant life that helps to produce the oxygen that we consume. Um, the quality of everything around us gets bigger and bigger as these circles of care extend and extend and extend. And so what might start off as a relatively selfish interest in, in me, me, me can be extended to a very, very broad interest in the quality of, of well, pretty much all life eventually because the, the benefit of one becomes the benefit of, of all. And this is based on this perception that we are all interrelated, which is very much an animist perception, that all life intersects with all other life at some point. And therefore to care for one is to ultimately try to care for all in as much as we can. There are some potential limitations here, but um, those can perhaps be discussed in some future talk. I've got an eye to the clock here. Uh, in terms of how this changes and waters and what the practical consequences of all this is, um, the quote there from Eua, an igluluk shaman, um, the greatest peril of life lies in the fact that human food consists entirely of souls. Um, Eua is not only talking about the eating of meat, it's also the eating of any kind of life, plant life included. So it, it's not a, a sort of... A, an exception to be made for vegetarians or vegans, it applies to everyone, in that aside from plants who photosynthesize, everything else consumes something that almost always dies in the process of being consumed, unless you're going to go around um, predating on carrion rather than bumping it off yourself. But whether you are consuming the life of a sheep or whether you are consuming the life of a carrot, you are nonetheless consuming the life of something. You are consuming a soul from an animist point of view. Um, Eor's resolution to this is not to starve yourself to death, but rather to value the life of that which is consumed through gratitude and reciprocity. To give thanks. A great many religions make a, a habit of giving thanks for the food um, that they consume at mealtimes. Um, 
so thanks partly to whatever uh, divinity you believe in, but also to the specific plants, animals, etc. that you're consuming, and the need for reciprocity. So if you benefit from eating uh, sheep, or you benefit from eating potatoes, or whatever it may be, then whilst you can't give reciprocally to the individual sheep or the individual potato that you've just eaten, because it doesn't exist anymore, you can nonetheless give reciprocal care to the collective of sheep or the collective of potatoes by ensuring the good quality of life for sheep or the good quality of the soil in which the potatoes grow and, uh, and the, the rain quality of the rainwater and so forth that, that um, nurtures and feeds the potatoes. <coughs> so there are ways in which where we take out of life for our own benefit, now be that for eating food or be that for chopping down a tree to build your house, whatever it may be, there's all sorts of impacts we have on the environment as we take out, there becomes a need to put back in. And this is where it feeds both through animism, um, the various forms of paganism and non-pagan religions and philosophies, um, all of which can embrace this idea that as we take out, so we should put back. Because if you just take, 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 what you end up with is, is a massive deficit and the kind of mess we have spent several decades becoming increasingly aware of in the world around us because there's been too much taking and not enough putting back. So this places the emphasis on changing our behaviour to be more grateful, more cautious in what we consume, how we consume it, and the reciprocity we show to give gratitude, to give thanks in a very practical way to the collective of the beings, plant, animal, whatever they may be, that we have taken from. Um, Jane Jacobs was a Canadian economist who developed an alternative argument. She referred to it as trader morality, an alternative to um, Nietzsche's ideas and Hegel's and various other people's ideas around what in English is translated rather badly as the master-slave relationship in economics which is where the, the buyer and the seller come together and the seller is trying to squeeze the maximum profit out of the buyer and the buyer is trying to squeeze down the price to get the best bargain from the seller and each side is wanting to effectively screw over the other side to walk away feeling happy. Jacobs argued that was a, a sort of doomed as an economic model to cause no end of misery and problems and that the trader model where two people come together, one of them has a bag of apples, the other has a bag of oranges, and they're each looking to get what they want. So the, the one with the apples wants the oranges and vice versa. They trade, they meet, neither is trying to exploit the other, neither is trying to squeeze the other uh, and, and screw them over. They are respecting each other's skills, they're respecting each other's goods and services, and they're seeking to make a fair trade. And obviously we have the, the whole notion of fair trade as a growing idea in um, many religions uh, and non-religious movements nowadays as a thing to pursue. Um, Lester Hunt took that idea and said this was a really good idea, but that it applied not only in economics, which is what Jane Jacobs was interested in, but it could be applied in many, many other kinds of areas of life as well. It could become a, a model for relationships that two people, or shall we be more animist and say two beings, come together and one wants one thing and the other wants another, they meet as equals and they exchange goods and services, they trade. Neither is trying to exploit, rip off or abuse the other. And that could be uh, family relationships, it could be friendships, it could be teacher-pupil, it could be employer-employee, it could be a whole raft of different types of relationships where if you're going down that more Nigerian model, one person is trying to screw over the other to get the maximum benefit from the least outlay. And that way, Hunt and Jacobs argue lies unhappiness and misery and inequality, whereas the other way, you meet with something to give to that person, you want something in exchange, you negotiate the trade, with an aim to both parties walking away happy not one party being happy and the other party being screwed over. That is, an, I would argue, an animist ethic. And it applies not just to how we relate to humans, but how we relate to all life. And so the emphasis becomes one of collaboration between myself and others, that I'm not trying to dominate or conquer or, or become subservient to. I wish to be neither slave nor master. 
to anybody else, but I wish to meet as equals one trader to another, one skilled person to another skilled person. And skilled persons, be they human or otherwise, can collaborate rather than exploit and rip off. Um, Aldo Leopold, another very prominent um, environmentalist, argued for the idea of the land ethic. Uh, and that's essentially just kind of repackaging all of the things that we've been talking about so far, that uh, a, a true ethic has to be not just how human treats human, but how we treat all living beings, how we treat the rivers, how we treat the fish, how we treat the birds, the trees, the reptiles, the mammals, the insects, the world around us, the whole land around us, how we engage and treat them. Uh, the idea of speaking for wolf is a story recanted by um, one of the Native American nations, the very, very, very short version of which is that there was a particular tribe who in the past used to migrate between winter grounds and summer grounds uh, and um, so they had a bit of a, I suppose, a nomadic existence. Uh, one day their um, summer ground was flooded and they couldn't move there. And so they had to find somewhere else to go. So they looked around and eventually they found a forest and they pitched camp at the forest. And every day they'd send the hunters off into the forest to, to catch stuff to eat. They'd hang the meat up overnight and in the morning it would all be stolen away. Um, this kept going on and on and on. And eventually they set someone to keep watch. And the someone in question saw the wolves come out of the woods, take the meat away from the, the drying racks and run off with it. And he followed the wolves into the forest, eventually tracked them down to their wolf council and spoke to them, which I think is a lovely idea personally and very animist, and asked them why they were stealing the, the human's meat. Whereupon the wolves sort of laughed up their sleeves, as it were, and said, we are not stealing your meat, you are stealing our meat. This is our hunting ground and you've just barged in here and started hunting all of the animals that we normally hunt. So we're just coming along at night to take back what you have ripped off from us in the first place. And the huntsman uh, have a discussion and negotiation. He explains their problem with the flooded land and so on. And they collaborate. They come to an agreement that the humans will be allowed to stay in the forest so long as they split the proceeds of the meat that they hunt. So the wolves get half and the humans get half and everyone's happy. And when he gets back to the tribe and explains this, they, they rename him Speaks for Wolf. And as an idea, this has been argued in all sorts of different contexts, business contexts and so on, that whenever you engage in something, a project, uh, some, some activity, you need to think about who is being impacted by this. Who are the wolves? Who is it that's going to be impacted by you changing a situation? And is anyone speaking for them? Can they speak for themselves? If not, is there someone who can speak on their behalf? Are they consulted or are they just run roughshod over? And so the idea of this story, though the moral of the tale, if you like, is that we should, in our daily lives, make an effort to consult, collaborate with the beings around us who may be impacted by our actions not just do as we damn well please and expect the rest of the world to fit in around it. Which again, you don't have to be pagan to go along with that as a, an argument, but it exists as a, as a, shall we say, as a proposal that could be adapted into all sorts of other religions and non-religious movements as a concept. Um, Ecofeminism is not exclusive to paganism, but there is a big overlap because of the prevalence of goddesses and priestesses within the various different pagan traditions. Um, feminism, particularly during the 60s and 70s, um, many, many feminists started to take an interest in paganism as a religious expression that allowed women to be front and centre rather than relegated them to a significantly lesser place. And a number of feminists then started to argue that um, there was a, 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 an overlap with ecology in that just as many cultures think of Mother Nature and they sort of feminize nature in, in Mother Nature, Mother Earth, etc., the way in which Mother Nature is treated often reflects the way in which human women are treated within a given culture. So if the culture is, is very domineering of women and, and sort of degrades them and reduces them to a servile position, it will often do the same to the natural world. And so societies that put women into a much better position 
a position of respect and equality, would tend to have respect and equality for the natural world around them. And so changing how one um, aspect of the equation is treated can change how the other aspect of the equation is treated. <coughs> and whilst animism is not specifically kind of gender oriented, it does factor in this notion of, of the way in which we treat people is often a reflection of the way in, well, human people, I should say, the way in which we treat the world around us, whether we're thinking specifically in gender terms or in much broader terms. Um, Arnes went on to coin this term deep ecology in which he argues that motivating people to become ecologically aware, plant trees, pick up litter, recycle their bottles and all the rest of it, um, whilst you can present scientific facts to them, whilst you can present economic arguments to them for why it saves money, etc., um, to get people truly motivated, to get them really on board, really engaged and doing more than the bare minimum, Ness suggests requires a spiritual element to this rather than a purely economic element or a purely scientific element to the arguments that if people regardless of what their actual religion or, or philosophy in life is if you can get them to embrace the holiness the sanctity of the natural world as a manifestation of, of the divine or a manifestation of the life force if you want to put it in more secular terms if they have that reverence that sanctity that sense of awe that sense of, of um, being deeply moved and attached to the land and all of the animals and the plants and so forth in the world around them, it's that sense of real spiritual commitment that will truly motivate people to change their behaviours in a whole raft of ways and not just do it in a very kind of dribs and drabs, minimalistic fashion, which is, it, he felt was too often the case. So whilst you don't have to be pagan to have that uh, outlook, there is clearly an overlap there between um, the, the pagan valuing of nature and, um, shall we say, disengaging it from paganism specifically to make that attitude available to and encouraged amongst people, regardless of whether they're Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, Jews, Christians, atheists, agnostics, whatever they may be, that approach to life could well be attached um, to many other philosophies and promote a, a greater environmental awareness. Which, thankfully for my voice and your ears, brings us to the end and almost exactly the same time as was done for the Faith Lecture in Ipswich. So, whilst I, I can't open it up to questions in quite the same way we did at the Faith Lecture, if anyone listening to this recording does have questions, by all means please email me that's my email and I will do my best to answer the questions by email um, regarding the various topics we've talked about today but thank you for listening and I'll end there take care